Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. Check them out. If you would like to see more of what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week and every subscriber helps. Time for another homebrew monster. This one is directly inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's story The Colour Out of Space. But on looking around for creature listings that place this monster solidly in the realm of Dungeons and Dragons lore, it seems everyone just wants to sweep it under the rug of the Far Realm because it's H.P. Lovecraft. It must be something from the Far Realm, right? Well, this one is not. I wanted to highlight just how alien some of the inner planes of existence can be and how alien the life forms are that dwell there. So what happens when basically an ordinary animal from the quasi-elemental plane of radiance becomes stranded on the prime material plane? What is it like to encounter this living alien radiance and what would be the immediate and long-term effects of this sort of incursion? Settle back, grab yourself a beverage, we're about to get deeply nerdy, somewhat disturbingly nerdy. First off, the plane of radiance exists as a border region of the inner planes, uh, the elemental planes between the elemental plane of fire and the positive energy plane. It is both very difficult to get to and not very well understood. For the Forgotten Realm settings, if you're using the Spelljammer model of the prime material plane, where the planet Toral, its moon, other planets and star all exist contained in an astoundingly large mysterious crystal sphere that floats in a sort of rainbow-hued hyperspace of misty phlogiston vapors. Then along the inner, uh, the inner side of this crystal sphere of realm space, there are numerous portals to the plane of radiance that range between 10 feet and hundreds of miles in diameter that appear at the dots and dashes of the strange writing that are marked on the inside surface of the sphere. These brilliant portals, thousands of miles apart from each other on the sphere's inner surface, are seen by the inhabitants of all the planets within the sphere as stars and constellations twinkling above them. When a spell jamming vessel or some such wishes to exit the crystal sphere of realm space, they create a portal directly above one of these radiant openings, which, from the point of view of those down on the planets, will appear to momentarily wink off and then back on again as the portal opens and closes. Normally such portals to the plane of radiance are not traversed by any beings, as radiance is highly destructive to creatures and spell gemmers that enter it unless heavily protected. For instance, the spell darkness must be used to simply provide protection similar to a pair of sunglasses, otherwise blindness is absolutely certain. Also, the plane is as hot as the plane of fire. The plane has subjective gravity and strangely a breathable atmosphere though, so it's not completely hostile and there are many beings that call it home. There is only one small island of solid ground in the entire plane called the Refuge of Colour, home to a mysterious tower of blue energy called the Heart of Light, which has incredible healing properties to those who visit there. The sentient races of this plane are few and far between, they include Radiant Mephits, Quasi-elementals, Dark Lights, Skyle, and Variso. But there is also a large number of life forms that are basically animals who wander around feeding on the ambient energy and minding their own business, unconcerned and unaware of the larger, larger multiverse entirely. Their wanderings may, on very rare occasion, take them to near to the strange thrumming portals to the inner surface of a crystal sphere like the one called Realm Space, and keep in mind the crystal spheres are not all the same, far from it, though many are like Realm Space. It has a strange and unique trait in that the space between all the worlds within it is quite warm compared to many other spheres, so perhaps this plays a part, as when a spell jamming vessel opens a portal to enter or exit the sphere, one day some hapless creature from the plane of radiance becomes caught up as if sucked down into an ocean maelstrom, and pops out into the stark and totally alien environment of the prime material universe, where it reacts with blind panic, first trying to get back where it came from, then having no luck, heading instead towards the next best thing, a ball of light and uh, heat and light at the centre of the sphere, the sun. Along the way, though, a passing planet captures it in its unfamiliar pull of gravity, and f it falls to the surface of Toril, very much like looking like a shooting star. Wherever it lands in your campaign, it might attract a little curiosity, 
It might not get any attention at all. Perhaps a small group of farmers send word to the local blacksmith who comes out to see if there's any of the fabled star metal. But if uh, they do find any impact crater, there's simply a crumbling and charred ball of chalky material that is quite useless for anything. Within a few days, it will just seem to shrink and dissolve away into thin air. Though within it, there are strange, brittle spheres of some glass-like material of weird hue that break open to reveal nothing, just a hollow space, perhaps with a vague wisp of some very strange, difficult-to-describe colour that none gathered have ever seen before. The alien radiance spun itself a protective ball of strange goop as it got closer and closer to the bright light of the sun, and now on Toral, so close to the star, the alien light causes it great discomfort and weakness, as though its own unique composition is contaminated by it. So, it escapes out of its shell and immediately seeks shelter in some cave or well, basement or under some rocks or tree roots. It's a medium-sized and amorphous entity that can squeeze into tight spaces fairly easily, and once secure, it begins to feel around for energy to sustain itself. At first, this will appear to enrich the life around it, causing plants to grow rapidly and flawlessly to unusual size and luster. However, they are contaminated with alien presence, and although technically edible, they taste foul and sickening, as if some invisible rot has spread all through the plants and their fruits. After several weeks, a strange blight will set in, a necrotic weathering that causes the plants to wilt, turn grey and brittle, then break apart bit by bit, with any straggling, struggling new growth being twisted and tumorous. Soon, animals will also start to become sick, suffering from exhaustion and breaking out in numb and ugly sores, rashes of, of oozing boils, blisters, and flesh that shrinks and darkens of us as if horribly bruised before gangrene sets in. The blood becomes poisoned, and the poor creatures turn rabid and crazed, their limbs and features becoming twisted as they seem to decay and mutate at the same time. Most will seem to run off. Sensitive animals like dogs, cats and horses will become loath to even approach the whole area. Farm stock, rodents and less mobile creatures will fall prey to these effects at variable rates. Any humanoids who live in the area will display strange behaviour which grows gradually worse and worse as the alien radiance slowly consumes all life of the area, gaining strength enough to try and escape this world and travel back away from the sunlight it would have fled deeper down into the Underdark if it could, but unfortunately the even stranger and more mystical Underdark energy called Phase Rest is even more damaging to this entity, trapping it near the surface world. Adventurers who investigate and seek a way to combat this creature are in for a difficult encounter, as the thing is just, is just so alien it is dangerous to interact with it directly. Just looking at it for too long can be dangerous as the alien radiance plays dreadful havoc with the mind, which has compulsion to try and make sense of the new colour it's seeing. The creature hides in darkness, surrounding itself with a protective slime of necrotized plant and animal matter, particularly animals that it has lured closer and snared in its tar-like pool. It is threatened by any sort of normal or magical light and will lash out if exposed. It is naturally insubstantial, quite resistant to harm, and can cause debilitation in those near it which it will take the opportunity to feed on, desperately, as it's simply trying to escape from the world and the prime material plane altogether. For stats, I aimed for a CR6 creature. It has an armor class of 12 and 8d10 plus 15, or between 23 and 95, with an average of 60 hit points. It is uh, plus 6 to constitution saving throws, plus 5 to wisdom saving throws. It's immune to cold, fire, lightning, and poison damage immune to being charmed, exhausted, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, knocked prone, unconscious, or restrained. The alien res uh, radiance is resistance, taking half damage from necrotic, radiant, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical at attacks, but those resistances only apply, apply when it's in dim light or darkness, so the light of a torch or daytime can remove that damage reduction. Also, it is vulnerable, so it takes double damage from any acid attacks, even though it's incorporeal. As an incorporeal entity, it hovers and flies at 50 feet per round. It can also swim up to 30 feet per round through liquids. It can move through other creatures and objects as though they were difficult terrain. 
Doing so does count as a withering touch attack, and it can't end its turn inside a non-liquid, or at the very least an opaque object, without taking 1d10 force damage. Its touch is plus 5 to hit, and inflicts 4d6 plus 3 necrotic damage. Also, each living creature within 60 feet of the alien radiance that can see it must succeed on a DC 14 wisdom saving throw, or be frightened for one minute. If the fail saves by five or more, the target becomes stunned for one minute instead. A frightened or stunned target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the condition on itself on a success. If a target saving throw is successful or the effect ends for it, the target is immune to the alien color for the next 24 hours. Because it feeds on energy, whenever the alien radiance is subjected to fire or lightning damage, it takes no damage and instead regains a number of hit points equal to the damage dealt. While in its dark and sticky gooed filled lair, it can use lair actions, drawing on the stored energy within itself and its captured food sources. On initiative count 20, losing initiative ties, the alien radiance takes a lair action to cause one of the following effects. The alien radiance can't use the same effect two rounds in a row. Spell effects all require a wisdom saving throw. Spell save DC is 16. It can create an effect identical to the color spray spell. It can release one of the partially consumed creatures within its ooze, causing an effect identical to the spell cause fear for those who see this horrid thing thing trying to escape. Or it can spend five of its hit points to create an effect identical to the spell Hypnotic Pattern. Finally, those who witness the alien color of this creature and fail their saving throw to the point that they become stunned, will also become obsessed with it, needing to witness it again, or somehow try to reproduce it, as if the color was a drug that they've become addicted to. This can be handled like a disease, but for a real Lovecraftian Call of Cthulhu feel to it, I like to mix the rules for disease with the effects listed for the symbol spell. So those who have been stunned are now afflicted by a progressive form of insanity. They need to make a DC 13 wisdom saving throw every 24 hours that elapse after they first become stunned by the witnessing the alien radiance. On a successful save, the insanity ends. On a failed save, the victim gains a progressively worse condition. The steps for this affliction are a bit like that of the various stages of exhaustion. Step 1. Compulsives. Compulsive. They have difficulty sleeping and think about the alien color all the time. They have disadvantage on all ability checks involving intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. Step 2. Manic. They must make a uh, they must roll a DC 13 wisdom saving throw every time they attempt to perform a skill, task, or simply have a conversation with someone that is not related to the alien color. The efforts to see it again or to reproduce it somehow. If they fail the saving throw, they bicker and argue for one minute, during which time they are incapable of meaningful, meaningful communication and have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Step three, obsessive. They must make a DC 13 wisdom saving throw if any attempt is made to take them further away from anything they believe will get them access to or reproduce the alien color. If they fail the saving throw, they are afflicted by fear of everything that uh, are but the object of their obsession. Full, uh, Full one minute, they drop whatever they're doing and holding and must move at least 30 feet towards the object of their obsession. They will also have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Step 4. Fixation. They must make a DC 13 wisdom saving throw to simply turn their attention away from the object of their obsession at all. They can't attack or target any creature with harmful abilities, spells or other magical effects and have disadvantage on all ability checks that are not directly related to trying to witness or recreate the alien killer. Step 5. Insanity. Every hour that they have not witnessed the alien color or reproduced it, they must make a DC 13 wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they become insane for one minute. An insane creature can't take actions, can't understand what other creatures say, can't read, and speaks only gibberish. The DM controls its movement, which is erratic, to say the least. This madness madness can be treated like any other disease, thankfully, and restoration magic works on it just fine. 
Encounters with creatures such as this are, in my opinion, best done with a lot of ex- um, with a lot of explaining what the characters see and feel in the area, but no explanation of what could be causing the disturbance. Explain what their characters are looking at, but don't describe the color. Don't offer any sort of DM's insight. Don't give them extra details from Akana or religion checks. No character will have had any training. Will have not read. They haven't read any accounts or books of theory on such creatures. They are completely rare and unknown. The mystery and lack of understanding is the source of the horror and is very important for making this a very memorable and spooky experience for the players. Do not hold back in describing the effect the slow and horrible debilitating wasting illness has on both the physical and mental state of the victims. The character's animal companions will be freaking out. The horses will try to run away. The local folk will try to stop the characters even going near the place. They may believe it's a plague or a curse. This might provoke violence between different humanoid communities. The humans might believe that elves, who are slower to suffer the effects, are to blame for the situation. There may be attempts by evil wizards to capture the alien radiance for experimentation. The radiance may cause a highly erratic and aggressive behavior from creatures that would normally shy away from civilized communities. There's loads of potential for roleplay, mystery, problem solving, alternative solutions, and stark, outright horror. Have fun with it. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Please buy some merchandise where you're geek with pride and as always. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.